When a sediment's brought on board, as we saw, it's split in half. And the very first thing that they do is take one half and store it for future studies. Or if some technique is invented, then they have, they can go back to those stored sediment cores and apply those new techniques and figure out new things about it. Because it's really expensive to go out to sea and grab a sediment core. The other half is looked at and just visually described. It's gray, it's black, it's different colors, it has different banding. That's called logging. And so that really, that initial step, just writing down notes of what they see, same as the kind of thing you might do in a lab class, is really important for figuring out later what those sediments might be composed of. So sediment logging, really important step and really important part of the descriptive classification of ocean sediments. And here you see some scientists aboard the ship. Here's the sediment core, again, the, the split half. And they're just visually writing down and describing what they see. Just literally writing down, this is what we see at different, and they keep track of how many inches they are below the surface of where, of where the, of the sediment core and all those kinds of things. And here you see another scientist making really careful notes. So it's not all about technology and it's not all about uh, sophisticated analyses. Just using our eyes and looking at sediments, we can tell a lot about them and that's an important step. All right, in that step, the first thing we try to figure out is what are the basic classes of sediments that we have? We have what are called granular sediments. And granular sediments are just pieces of rock or pieces of biological material, pieces of shell. Okay, those are called granular sediments, fragments of inorganic or organic materials. And then we have chemical sediments, and those are the ones that are derived from some precipitation process, either evaporation of uh, seawater or precipitation of minerals in a hydrothermal vent, those kinds of things. So, two types of sediments broadly, granular sediments and chemical sediments. Granular sediments may be lithogenous, as I mentioned previously, meaning they form from the weathering and breakdown of rocks igneous, metamorphic, or sedimentary rocks. Biogenous sediments, or biogenous granular sediments, come from organisms. So, two types of rocks, granular chemical, but granular sediments can be broken down even further, whether they're inorganic or lithogenous or organic, biogenous. Sand's a familiar lithogenous granular sediment. Seashells are a familiar biogenous sediment. So the sand that we find at the beach comes from the rocks up in our local mountains. The sand is primarily composed of quartz and feldspars, and we'll learn a little bit more about that when we talk about beaches later in the semester. But this is inorganic material that's been transported from our local mountains to our local beaches. Here's a beach in Florida, and it's full of seashells. This is the kind of beaches that I grew up with, with all these different seashells and generally these are broken down even further these are you know is really a rich collection of intact shells but any fragments of these seashells also qualify as sediments okay hydrogenous sediments are ones that form in place so hydrogenous sediments would be the kinds of things that we again find on hydrothermal vents okay metals the the metals that we find on hydrothermal vents. They form through a chemical process, so they're really a type of chemical sediment. Now those hydrothermal vent towers, those black smokers and other kinds of features that are produced on a hydrothermal vent are rich in metals and actually are being looked at as a source of metals. There's a little bit of conflict there because we know so little about hydrothermal vent communities. We know they could be really important biologically, so we really don't want to start strip mining hydrothermal vents to grab their metals. But if we can do it in a responsible way, they could be a rich source of sediments. Evaporites, something produced through evaporation, like salts, halite, is a good example of a hydrogenous sediment. Even limestones, uh, like a limestone countertop or limestone floors, are a type of chemical sediment. Okay, this is a picture of halite, which is a, just made up of salt crystals. So it's a type of chemical sediment, and you saw earlier pictures of hydrothermal vents. Okay, 
As I already said, biogenous sediments are sediments that come about because of biological processes. And they actually are important too because they form one of the largest reservoirs of carbon on our planet. Carbon is part of carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. So knowing how organisms use carbon dioxide and store carbon dioxide tells us something about how we can get rid of carbon dioxide. If we can store carbon dioxide at the bottom of the ocean, take it out of the atmosphere and store it in the bottom of the ocean, if we understand the natural processes, we might be able to enhance those processes, but it also tells us what is the potential for natural processes to absorb that carbon dioxide that we're producing in the atmosphere. Well, the principal carbonate forming organisms and carbonate, really just talking about calcium carbonate, carbon, the principal ones are the microscopic organisms. And the two main or three main types I want to talk about here are the foraminifera, which I already introduced, diatoms, which are a type of really ornate phytoplankton or plant plankton uh, that we find offshore. We really find it throughout the entire ocean, even living in ice. So we want to look at diatoms. And a, another group of sort of small protozoan like organisms called radiolarians. Now the differences between these are subtle but important. Foraminifera have calcium carbonate. Diatoms are made up of silica and carbonate. Radiolarians are also made up of silica and carbonate. So for scientists interested in other kinds of elements like calcium or silica, these organisms represent different pathways by which the silica and the carbon and the carbonate end up uh, from the atmosphere or uh, through whatever processes brings those materials into the ocean to the bottom of the sea. The deposits of these organisms on the seafloor are called oozes. I love that word. A diatom ooze is a deposit, really a mud, of diatom shells. A foraminiferin ooze is a deposit of foraminiferin shells or foraminiferin mud. So if you go down and grab a sample of that mud and take a look at it, you would see the shells of foraminifera or radiolarians or diatoms. Half the sediments that we find on the seafloor, remembering now that over half the seafloor is mud, essentially abyssal plains, and half of that is made up of these oozes. So there's a lot of biological material at the bottom of the ocean. And that's an important storehouse for carbon. Here's some diatoms. This is a particular chain forming kind of diatom, chain forming pennate diatom called Catoceros. This is a sample of plankton from the Antarctic. You also see a, down here a little centric diatom. And I think I have this on the screen here, pennate diatom. These are photosynthetic. Their shells are made out of silica. And see how intricate they are. Look how all these different fine structure. And this centric diatom down here, um, as we'll see in just a second, also has a really ornate shell. This is a radiolarian. It builds its shell out of silica as well. Excuse me, this is a silica flagellate. My apologies. It also builds its shell out of silica. So these organisms, as they absorb these elements and create their shells, something we'll learn about a little bit more in chapter six, but as these organisms remove calcium and, and carbon and silica out of the ocean and incorporate it into their shells, it becomes a sediment. And then when it sinks to the bottom of the ocean, that becomes a storage place for those particular elements.